Good morning, everybody. Hi. Thank you so much for coming uh, this, this morning. This is the uh, last series of Immersion Parent Partner Meeting, Session 6, and it will be talking about uh, uh, parents as immersion advocates in the community. And uh, I'd like to start with a, a quick, maybe brainstorming. Um, what comes to your mind when you hear the word advocate? Now, that's a, a interesting word. We don't usually use this word, not, not so much, but, but um, when you hear this word advocate or um, maybe support or something like that, supporting educational program, what comes to your mind? Maybe we can just brace on the ticket. Yes. <coughs> yes. Uh, did, did you hear that? She's mentioned that it's a it's like a positive force working towards um, something that you believe in. Could be an educational cause, could be a political cause, but something that we believe that something should be done, and we kind of positively and I really love the word positively working towards influencing. That's great. Anybody else? What comes to your mind, advocate, when or supporting education program? What? It's like something to reinforce, something that the kids they are learning. Yes. Something to make more, more strong what, what they are getting. I love that. Reinforcement. Like something that they're already working towards, we can do something to make it stronger. And that's exactly how uh, I believe the parent advocate works. Thank you. Yeah. All right, anybody else? Really nice words here. Right, and then uh, if you know Jenny at all, I mean, she is she has this a very political scope of you know, um, and so that shows, in other words, um, the range of advocacy. Somebody who would think about students as parents and would like to help them—that's advocacy. And also, it goes as wide as a political arena, uh, to Sacramento, even sometimes national level, to advocate for good education, and. Uh, in this country, it is, it is interesting to me, um, in Japan, we don't have this word in terms of education because pretty much the uh, government decides what students are going to learn. And uh, uh, the consensus among parents, Japanese parents anyway, uh, is that we don't bother them. You know, they, I'm sure they have the best interest of us. We don't bother them. We just let them do whatever they want to do. And that goes to... Uh, school administration as well. We don't really tell them what we want. We just sort of believe that they, they know our best. Um, but when I came to America, I found out that advocacy or advocating for education is a very important part for, for education process. And in the spot that you feel as an, an advocate, um, a very important thing, and I, that, I still kind of struggle with that notion a little bit, but I'm catching on to that. Um, so advocate basically is a verb to speak or write in favor of, or support or urge by argument. So recommend publicly, and the word here is the publicly. It is a public stance that we take, and here's an example, he advocated higher salaries for teachers, yay. All right, sorry. <laughs> I had to give that right there. Okay, also it can be a noun. Uh, a person who speaks or writes in support or defense of a person's cause um, and it's an advocate for peace. And interestingly, it comes from the Latin root word to call. Call for a court testimony. So somebody would call upon you and to come and to speak on behalf of somebody or some, some case. That's what advocate or advocacy is. So when we think about this, we say, hmm, what does that have to do with immersion education? You know, why do I have to be an advocate of immersion education? Well, there is a very close relationship between immersion education and apparent advocacy, uh, believe it or not. 
and uh, it goes back to the beginning of immersion education. And uh, it was actually a small community-based project, the Immersion Education List, in the city of St. Lambert, Canada, uh, a lingual, uh, unilingual French province. And they, uh, some parents there, English-speaking parents, minority family, were seeking to become proficient in French because that was the language of status in Canada. Uh, and then they want their kids to be able to speak French. But at the time, they didn't have a good French uh, foreign language education. Kids came up with very minimal proficiency in that language. So these parents convinced the educators. They stood up as a group of parents and they said, you know what, we're going to have to demand this. We need our uh, school, school teachers to teach French, but not just to teach it, but use French to teach the subjects like math and science. So they wanted to do this uh, switch, um, language switch between home and school. It was a radical idea, um, but they brought prof you know, uh, college professors on board and they talked to the, the school district and they started their first, in, in the whole world, the first immersion program in St. Lambert. And then what happened? Well, this caught on fire. This spread all over Canada because they saw the students gain proficiency in for French um, like they've never seen before. So now it, 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 uh, it spread to U.S. and uh, at the time in the U.S. The, the foreign language learning was largely audiolingual and grammar based. It was like a textbook kind of approach. Then um, it shifted to communicative approach in 1970s, and then here it happened, um, uh, the, the immersion project in Canada, and then Culver City, that's us! <laughs> it's one of the first districts to really duplicate that St. Lombard project in Spanish. Uh, and that was, I mean, it's a long story made short, but so we actually are beneficiaries of what happened in Canada back in 1965. And it spread all over America. Uh, in the 30 cities in, by 1987, and then by 1999, about 46,000 students in 11 languages. And then this is outdated, to be honest with you. This is what happened in uh, immersion program in the US. It just sort of caught on in numbers. Also, the dual, so the number now is the 2006 is uh, 263 foreign language immersion programs in the U.S. school alone. One group of parents in Canada, they made huge difference for the entire world, basically. It's in Russia now, it's in uh, South America, it's in Europe, I mean, it's in the U.S., it's everywhere. Even in Japan, immersion education has spread because of those parents who said, we want the best for our students, for our, for our children. Um, this is the dual immersion uh, stats. Has dual immersion meaning that they have now two different groups, language groups in the same classroom. Like 50% Spanish dominant, 50% English dominant students. And then they learn from each other. That, uh, programs has caught on uh, as well. So, what does this show us? Basically, it shows us that without the support and the request of parent communities, there might be no birth and growth of emerging education. Also, it is the voice of parents that reaches schools and administration that opens doors for emerging programs, believe me. It's when parents speak, district listens, because they want to meet the needs of the community. Um, give, me, give my child the options for their education, that's the voice the parents will make, and then the district will heed against cultural norms uh, uh, for educational establishment. Sometimes for minority groups, it's kind of scary. I don't know about you, but you know, um, my mom would be scared to speak up for my education. 
because this is not her country. This is, she doesn't, you know, speak that much English. So she would like, oh, you know, whatever they decide is fine, you know. But against such cultural norms, in America, parent advocacy for educational programs are vital. It's very important. Um, so, any questions after this moment? Any, any comments? So I think after it was created, then it was developed like a, a how do you say, techniques and right. Then if that came after, right? Or have um, we been following the same techniques since it started? Yes, I believe the. Um, yeah, I guess parents were in search of better methodology, if you will. And then the, I think the college professors helped. Um, and then so they, they came together and, and did that. That's what I think. Yeah. Um, and we still, we kind of still follow the same path. Um, when parents say we want the better education for, for ch children, and for example, my, my, my child, Johnny, he, he needs to speak better Spanish. What can you do? And the parents starting to search, and there may be somebody in the parent group that says, "Yeah, I know so and so that works in university, or I know so and so who's really involved in bilingual education. Maybe I can ask that person." And then sort of it came, you know, it comes together. Um, yeah, and then believe me, what you do, it makes a huge difference. Um, so, any any other any other comments on this? I'm sorry, I don't want to hurry. Okay. So there are reasons for advocating emerging education, and I could think of some. First one is it's educational enrichment. It really brings about enrich, enriched education for students. Um, another thing for to advocate is the preservation and maintenance of native language and culture. Now, uh, in America, I, I'm not hesitant to say this, that Right now, in, in regular schools, uh, mainstream schools, they may not value second language as much. They, they, they all push for English, and English only, if you will. But, but the research shows that it is very important to maintain their first language for their second language development, even. So I'd like to talk about that. That's another thing to advocate for emerging education. Um, Rigorous and not remedial academic curriculum for second language learners. Meaning, you know, when a student is not proficient in English, sometimes what the, the method the teacher would take is to sort of water down the curriculum, make it easy for that child to understand. But that has the adverse effect on the child, especially in terms of developing academic skills. So um, immersion education doesn't do that. It offers very rigorous academic curriculum, uh, very high-level curriculum. So that's another thing that emerging education is really good, good at. Um, another thing to uh, advocate is the multiculturalism, of course. Emerging education is at the core of positive uh, uh, cultural um, integration, if you will. So that's another thing that we can be proud about emerging education. We can tell other parents, our school board, um, and the whole world, basically. Uh, so let's go each one of these, one by one. First of all, educational enrichment. What's, what's so special about emerging education? Well, number one, students acquire another language while studying general education. Isn't this huge? I, I think that's great. Um, I tell my students when, I, when I'm in the classroom, you know, your parents want to give you a gift of language when they enroll you in this program. You may not realize this now, but not everybody in the whole world speaks two languages. You know, and not everybody in Culver City School District learn math and science in two different languages. But you do. I mean, this is a privilege. And they say, okay, it's a great thing to be in this school. It is, it's a great thing to be in this program, you know? Um, I really think that they acquire another language while studying what everybody else studies in, in their schools. Another thing is they learn about other cultures through music, art, and festivals. I mean, right now, I know that those opportunities are getting rare 
in, in regular schools uh, due to emphasis, let's say, on um, testing or just getting into you know, books and getting to learn so much content there. But kids are so open to learning about other people, other cultures, art, and music. What well, emerging education happens to think that these things are very important. Um, and uh, excuse me, another thing is preservation and maintenance of native language and culture. So, immersion program offers additive bilingual program, which basically means that. English learners do not lose their native language while acquiring English. And then that is not true for all schools. Um, very often, um, what's, what we put in place in California called the English Immersion, um, they will, typically they lose their first language as they acquire the second language, which is English. It's called subtractive bilingualism. Um, and, uh, you know, it's true for pull-out ESL, it's true for English immersion. Unfortunately, it is also true for early, uh, we, uh, early exit bilingual program where they pull out kids uh, around like second grade. And they will be immersed in English only. When that happens, um, they most likely lose their first language unless parents insist that they speak that language at home. With, with their friends or with their in-laws. I mean, unless that effort is made, they can hear and understand Spanish, but they will not be speaking Spanish. That happens a lot. But at the immersion education, they leave, they, uh, they retain their first language and while they add the second language, which is English. It's a wonderful thing. I think that's, I don't know why the whole world is not doing this. You know what I mean? Oh, of course I'm biased, <laughs> I mean, but you know, um, their native language and culture are respected and valued. This is so true. Um, when I was a high schooler, and that's when I came to America, I realized that my culture and my language were not respected in, in the school that I attended. Actually, I was labeled, so did, you know, uh, as not main stream student, you know, I, I, I always felt like I was a second class citizen because I didn't speak English fluently, I did not read English fluently, and I was not accultured into English, American culture, I should say. But it, that's not true for immersion education. In immersion school, the target language culture is valued. Spanish culture, uh, uh, you know, heritage culture, uh, Japanese culture, and their language is respected. So that caused them to retain their first language as well. Um, so it is, it is a wonderful uh, program. Another reason uh, for us to be proud about Immersion School is that it offers academic curriculum, math, uh, science, social studies, and so forth, without watering down the content to second language learners. Um, grade level academic contents are not watered down for second language. So for example, if I teach uh, science in Japanese to Japanese natives, I am not watering down the content because I am delivering the instruction in their language. Um, and then immersion teachers are typically really good at scaffolding the students and making the subjects com understandable. So that even though they learn some subjects in English, it's sheltered and usually content are not watered down, which is wonderful. Um, development of academic thinking skills are not compromised. And this is, I would like to emphasize that. Just because your child uh, is a second language learner and they don't know how to, for example, sequence put things in order in English does not mean that he or she cannot do it in his or her native language. You know, it does not mean that he or she cannot think and order things. It's just that they may not have the language to do it. Does that make sense? Um, so when I was in high school and I didn't speak English well, you may say like, oh, you don't speak English that well now. Like, that's true. but. Um, it was worse, but <laughs> in high school. And uh, people, my friends, all, they, my classmates thought that I was, I, I lacked intelligence for the better choice of the world. I could not do 
what they could do in math. But actually, and I don't mean to brag, but math is a little more advanced in Japan in, in their pacing. So I could, it was a breeze for me. But they said, how could you do that? You don't speak English. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I, can, I can think, you know. I, I don't have the language, but I mean, I, I, those are, I can do this pre-curriculus, you know, no problem. Um, that's the thing about, but when, when the, um, due to the lack of language, teachers starting to water down the content, and the kids are, kids are learning, uh, kids are not challenged in their th academic thinking, then that can affect their thinking skills, especially academic thinking skills. And then they may not develop that age appropriately. Um, that is not a good thing. Um, immersion education is not a remedial uh, curriculum. It is actually very rigorous. We don't water down the content, but we try to teach, deliver those uh, content instruction in the target language and shelter in way. So kids will still get, that, get to develop their academic skills even though they may not be proficient in English or other language. This is very important. Um, and the last, very important, is the multiculturalism. Uh, emerging education fosters in students uh, tolerance and appreciation for different cultures. And this is true uh, by survey as well. There's kind of research out there and the data that says emerging, emerging students, they are open to other cultures, talking, getting to know them, getting to work with them. They're very, not only tolerant, but appreciative of those people who are different from them. Um, and that's amazing, you know. Uh, and I try not to be biased in my um, uh, thing, but uh, uh, so it was great, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, and uh, um, immersion education also enhances respect for people groups different from themselves. Um, and it affords unique opportunities to connect with the target culture, exchange trip, uh, pen palling, whatever. And beyond that, they have the language to communicate. And I don't know about you, but the moment, you know, some people are looking like really strange to me because they're from different cultures, but the moment I, I'm able to communicate with that person, then I find out that he is the same human being as I am. And I don't want to sound strange, but isn't it true? Language breaks down the communication barriers. It breaks down the cultural barriers. We find out that they're just like us. And in this education style, kids get that tool. They get that language that they, are, you, they can use to sort of think globally and break down those walls between peoples. <sighs> Enough said, right? <laughs> I mean, so I'm just going back to this uh, list. Those are the reasons that we can really advocate to other parents in the district and say, you know, this is a great program. Um, and that we really want this in our, in our district and our schools. Um, and when parents speak up like that, district listens. Um, that's my opinion. Okay, any questions about these? Any, any comments? Okay, so the, so, but, you know, uh, Yamakawa Sensei, I am, I am not that um, outgoing and as um, assertive as Jenny <laughs> and, and, and uh, Gina Marie. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure if I, what can I do? I'm, I'm just, uh, uh, I just am just, but I'm a mom. You know, I'm, a, I'm just, a, a, you know, somebody who loves to just send kids to school. And I don't know what I can do to advocate immersion education. Well, believe me, there are ways that you can definitely support immersion education in your community. And no pressure here. I don't mean to build any pressure. But I just like you to know that there are some ways that you can really support immersion programs. Um, and in just a minute, I would like to introduce those ladies who are doing that. Um, but um, so one way to do it is the personal experiences. 
It's about your child. Powerful. I mean, who can refute that? When you say, you know, my child is enjoying immersion school very much. That's one thing to say. And then people will say, really? I mean, tell me more. I mean, why would I, why would I lie to them about that, you know? Uh, that's one. School community on display. <laughs> the powerful testimony. And we have that, uh, at least because I don't know La Bayona, I don't know other schools, but I do know that in El Marino, when school community comes together for this cause of language immersion, it's a powerful way to tell others that, you know, we have something here that we really treasure. Um, your professional vocation, maybe you have a very specialized vocation or skill or talent. We can use those to advocate for immersion education. Also, call to action. And this is where it, things get a little more political. And this is not for all the parents, obviously. But um, there are ways that we can let our voice be heard uh, at the district level and the state level and the national level. Okay, so personal experiences, you know. Um, oh, oh, oh. Okay. Um, something like share your experiences at emergent school with your neighbors, you know? So where did your child go to school, you know? And it's just a kind of small talk there. It says, yeah, we go to this language immersion school. Language immersion school? What kind of school is that? Well, let me tell you, you know? <laughs> and, uh, oh yeah, yeah, just, if you have a time, have a seat, you know? <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and then we talked about educational enrichment, we talked about, um, multiculturalism, we talked about advances for English learners, all these things that uh, you can tell them. And uh, I can even show example of my child's written work in both languages, given that they're selected carefully. <laughs> and uh, you know, look, this is what my child can do. Oh my gosh, he can do this, he can do that, you know? Wonderful evidence. Um, also, a personal testimony Describing how the program has helped your child is often the best evidence of program success. I mean, who can refute that? I mean, when you have that first-hand experience, very effective. Um, another way is the school community on display. So if somebody is interested then, wow, so you go to this, you know, El Marino whatever school over there, huh? You know? then would you like to come? Uh, we have an event going on on the Children's Day. We celebrate Cinco de Mayo and then also um, J Japanese Children's Day to, kind of together on, on, on that week. So would you like to come and see? And they, if they say yes, oh my goodness, they will see this wonderful things happening on campus. And that's the power. And you see parents working together. You know, uh, uh, Gina Marie can talk about that. You know, I mean, there are parents who really believe in this emerging education, and it's infectious. And somebody may say, I would like to be part of that. I don't want to just go through my child's education, just sort of whatever, whatever. You know, I would like to connect with the school community like that. And you know the parents do that best. You know, teachers may not be able to do that, but parents can. Um, showcasing the school community in action um, Seeing families speaking and having a good time in two languages encourages others to join in the fun and experience with themselves the rich reward of immersion education. This is so true. And thanks to all of them and thanks to advocacy who make those things happen here. We can't, we can't do that without them. Um, your professional vocation. Uh, if... Um, if you, you, if you have unique professional skills and talents, you can use that to publicize their school. For example, uh, write articles about the school. Some parents do that. Um, create school videos for the community. Uh, 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 we have a wonderful parent over there videotaping. And can you, can you imagine putting video like this on YouTube, you know, sending the link and just share this with your you know, friends and families? powerful outreach. Um, become a liaison to connect your company with the school. Uh, 
invite uh, student groups to perform at your job-related events. Like, let's say, you know, if you got some uh, company celebration going, it says, you know, my child goes to this immersion school, and they have, a, they have a flamenco group. You know, would you like to invite them? Or, uh, is it possible? <laughs> She's the one that leads that group. You know? come, come and just, and so when they see these kids just so rich in culture of other language, and they go, hmm, what kind of school is this? And their interest is piqued. I mean, it's very powerful. And only you could make something like that happen because you're already in the company. Um, it, we can't really contact and you know, make things happen like that because it's very difficult. Um, so definitely those are the things that, there are other things that you can do using your own vocation and skill. Also, the last call to action in this part is a little bit long. And, and what I like to do is um, just give you a quick view, but uh, Maybe, maybe you know. Um, maybe at this point, I would like to just turn over the uh, to you guys and talk about what you do, and then um, this call to action. Maybe I can just. I, I have a writing. I have a handout, so maybe I could just kind of run up and just make copy and give it to you. Is that okay? So maybe. Um, yeah. yeah, come on up. Come on. Would you give a big round of applause, Jim and Marie and Jenny? Okay. Thank you. That I just really sparked to, and I just thought, wow, this is such an incredible program. And, you know, and everybody should know about it. So it was more of me being kind of a cheerleader, but then also finding out that, you know, this program has been here for four years, and um, and it was really, really hard to get started. It started with one class, and um, you know, we, you know, every year it got bigger and bigger, and now we're at capacity. I mean, it's huge. It's we're one of the largest. I think, aside from Texas, one of the largest elementary schools, and it's just so popular and doing so well. But it needs to be further expanded to the middle school and possibly high school. And that's just something that's difficult, because when you're here at El Molino, I'm not sure if I'm answering this question, but I'm going to tell you specifically what I'm working on. Um, you. We were all here focused on El Marino. When you get to the next level, you're a smaller segment in a larger population, and you're sharing resources. So that's, for me, where you know, advocating is, is really important, because you need to say, hey, wait a minute, you know, we have this incredible program. Let's continue it. Let's put more resources. Give us more teachers. Give us more classes. Um, so that's kind of where I am and, and have been trying for four years or so to get the program stronger. Um, and I think what I've been doing is just researching other schools in other areas. And like I said, Texas, Portland has an incredible Japanese program that uh, Yamakawa Sensei has they've been visiting and they've been trying to model. And it's, um, they're up to, those classes go all the way up to actually university level, like some of their students can actually take classes at the university. Um, there's a school in Long Beach, a Spanish immersion program, that their kids are in eighth grade last year took the high school AP Spanish test. And I don't know the results yet, but it was because, you know, they're taking all their courses, sixth, seventh, and eighth, just like here at El Marino, they're continuing, you know, all the way up, that by the time the goal of that program is, by the time they graduate from high school, they will already maybe just be, be shy a few classes to have a minor in Spanish, which is pretty incredible if you think about it. I mean, it's a, it's like a minor, it's a savings, you know, in terms of being able to take all these courses, and they're ready for it. Um, and so I think a call to action. We do petitions, we do um, try to have more things like this where we educate the parents about what's going on. I think the next step where I have not been very good because I don't speak Spanish fluently by any means, but I do think that we need a, we need an advocate from the Spanish speaking community to go out because I met a parent from Oaxaca. I was at La Bayona my first year and I told her about El Marino. I said, you have to send your child here. You, know, you're, you speak Spanish, you, you have a higher chance of getting in here because they need Spanish speakers. No, no, no. Um, and I'm speaking in my broken Spanish. She says, it's very important to me that my child knows English. And she said, you know, she didn't want to. So third grade, you know, flash forward three years, she's here. She had gone home to Oaxaca, and her son could not speak to his relatives and can't speak to her. 
And it was just devastating. She's like, I have to get him, you know, I have to, he has to speak Spanish. So she came back here, and they had him tested, and unfortunately his English was stronger than his Spanish, and they said it would be detrimental to him to switch him back to Spanish. So she's, she was stuck. She had to stay in the English program at La Bayona. And I, you know, I don't know where she is. I mean, I told her, to just keep trying to do Spanish at home. But again, it's about, you know, keeping that Spanish up. And I just think it's so important to, you know, Spanish-speaking families that, I mean, I always feel like I'm so jealous. Like, oh, we get to speak Spanish at home, and we can't. You know, my husband's not Spanish. and um, But my language is English, and I speak to my daughter in English because that's my language. I can't. She now hears my accent, and it's terrible. I mean, I hear her accent, it's beautiful, and you know, the language for us skipped a generation, so it's really amazing to me to see that happen. Imagine if you could take an immersion, uh, have an immersion education for your child. I mean, it should, that's, that was always my hope, that anybody that wanted it, you didn't have to go through the lottery, that you could get it. Um, and then one other thing I should mention is there is a River City immersion group that's a Yahoo group if you're interested. I can just figure it out. You know, we, we used to meet a lot last year, and then we had some vision, strategic vision planning meetings about the program. It sort of has fallen off the chart a little bit, but we're trying to get it in. And, and uh, I'm, since I'm a fifth grade parent, I'm looking for somebody to talk with. Thank you. Okay. To give a big round of applause. They really show you what they do. Uh, an hour or two. <laughs> it's so, uh, uh, but I mean, they're the, they're the ones who really are key persons that, that you could go to and that you could go, uh, hey, can I support? Can I do anything? Uh, and then I'm sure they'll put you to work. <laughs> okay, um, so this is the handout I'd like to give to you to take home. Uh, there are some ways that you could get involved uh, in making your voice be heard. Uh, called action. This was taken from uh, uh, Cal, the Center for Applied Linguistics, for Immersion Language Tool, and there's some uh, helpful resources here. Thank you so much for coming today.